Yo, 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 what's up? My name is Chris. Welcome to my garage where I host poker. Actually, I haven't hosted poker in going on eight months now because of the Rona. All I gotta say about that is ooh, coronavirus. Oops, I guess I can't say that. Uh, I guess we're PG-13 now. I only get one F-bomb. Sorry about that. Uh, it's uh, empty garage because I'm 50, I'm a bit overweight, and uh, most of my friends are my age or older who play in my garage, so it's just been really sad. It's really empty here, but hopefully we'll be getting back, you know, at some point next year. In the meantime, I've been working a lot, but I have some time on my hands, and I thought I'd share with you a little bit more information on how to run a poker tournament in your house or in your garage. I've been doing this for over 10 years. So I do know what I'm doing, and a lot of that experience and knowledge has come through trial and error. So I thought I'd share with the YouTube universe how to better run things at home if you're having a poker night. And this video is about poker tournaments, and it's about seeding poker tournaments. Make sure you look at my poker video number 18, which is the perfect starting stack. And then there's another one about coloring up. I think it's right after that. Both are very informative, have lots of good info on how many chips to give your players, uh, the kind of blind structures that you need, and also how you deal with racing off chips or coloring up chips. Good stuff. Uh, we're gonna continue with the tournament theme. We're gonna talk about seeding. Now, I know you're saying to yourself, Chris, seeding, what the hell is that? It's an important topic, and it's one that people don't think too much about until they're already running a tournament, and then they realize, oh, there's a lot going on with seeding. We're gonna be talking about seeding your players when they arrive, we're going to be talking about balancing tables. We'll get into that. And we're also going to be talking about breaking tables. Now, three topics. Two of the topics are only if you have multiple tables. I would strongly advise, if you're hosting a poker tournament for the first time, one table only. Keep it to nine or ten players maximum. Now, seating players at the beginning of the tournament. You may say to me, Chris, that's silly. What do you mean seating? Players come in, they give me money, and I tell them to take a seat wherever they like, right? Wrong. Poker tournaments are tricky because poker tournaments, especially No Limit Hold'em, position is everything. And anybody who plays this game at all understands that position is everything. You want stronger players on your right, you want not as strong players on your left, and there's going to be a bunch of jockeying for position. You're going to have people showing up late, showing up super early. It's going to be chaos. Many lives will be lost. Seating has to be random in a poker tournament. So that's number one. Make sure your seating is random. And I'm going to tell you how to do it. There's several methods of doing it. I'm going to tell you my method, what works the best for me. I've tried all the different methods. Uh, one method is to do it randomly by computer, whatever tournament software you're using. You've got to enter all the names and hit the button and it randomly assigns them. Then you have to have a place on that software to post that so people can see it and find their seats. That's rather involved. Uh, a way my friend does it, um, when he hosted in Los Angeles, he ran a great game. He got a stack of business cards from Vistaprint with a clear space on the front and he would write in Sharpie everybody's names that was coming that night and then shuffle up the business cards and he would walk around and deal out the cards to the seats. Uh, that's a good way to do it. It's totally random and it's, it's relatively easy and cheap. Um, it's especially easy to do with one or maybe two tables. Once you get into the three tables and beyond like I have, I typically have three full tables every tournament. Uh, it's a bit more involved than that. I use these seating plaques. Now, don't freak out, I bought these at smartsign.com, and they are expensive, they're a couple bucks a piece at least, and I, of course I have 30 plaques, uh, even though my tables are only one through nine, uh, I bought 10 each, one for each table. You don't have to buy anything, I'm going to tell you how to do this without buying seating plaques, but I like it because it's custom, it says table one, seat one, you know, table one, seat six, it has all the seats. First of all, I give myself the seat that I want, which is always table one, seat one. It's right in the middle of table one. I can see everybody. Give myself that. Then I take the other plaques. So I got three full tables. Take the, hold this together, and then you just shuffle them up like a deck of cards. Boom, boom, boom. See how that goes like that? You just shuffle and mix. I do this ahead of time before people show up. I've already got all the stacks out. Chairs are ready, all that good stuff. Mix it up, and I scramble like a dealer. Scramble, dealer, scramble. So we say in Los Angeles. 
And then it's like this. So when people walk into my garage, I greet them. I'm already sitting in my table. I've got everything I need. You should have a cash box where you're going to keep the money. It's nice to have one that can be locked. Put the money in there. You know what I'm saying. And they give you the money. You put it in the box and you say, pick a seat. And they pick a seat. And they say, oh, you're at table one, seat five. That's this table. You're right here, seat five. Have a seat. Somebody else comes in, they pick a table. Oh, you're at table two. That's the blue table right over there, seat one. Oh, where do they know where to sit? Well, the thing I do is I put the dealer button on seat one, and I make sure it's like firmly on seat one. I put it on, if the table has a rail, I put it on the rail. Uh, the felt tables, I put, put it right at seat one. I say the button's on seat one, so that's right where you sit. Sit at the button right over there. Somebody comes in with, and says, oh, I got table three. And I say, oh, that's the green table. See how they're all color coded? Eh. If you do get custom plaques, I like to have different color poker tables and coordinate, so it's all easy. But it's not necessary. I say, table three, that's the green table over there, seat eight. Remember, the button is on one, so just count around from the button. Right? Okay. So, seating plaques, that's how I seat my poker tournaments. I make sure everybody picks their seat. Uh, if I've got late players, I usually typically have a couple late players. I'll have one or two or three or four plaques left. I'll just collect them myself and I'll keep them by my side. And when the late player walks in, I'll shuffle it right in front of them. And I'll say, okay, pick a seat. And then they pick a seat. That's how that works. So, seating players, that's it. It's pretty straightforward. What I like about having plaques or having seating cards is that it's totally random and the players themselves are the ones picking. So they know there's no shenanigans, they know it's open, free, and fair, and all that. Now I promised I was gonna share with you a cheap way to do this, so you don't have to spend money on a custom plaques. They also have, I think there's websites that have seating cards, uh, they're pretty affordable. I'd recommend laminated seating cards or seating plaques. But the cheap way to do it is to just use a deck of cards. Now, there's really only one key to this equation, is whatever cards you're using for your tournament, if it's poker size or bridge size, you know, poker decks come in two, two different sizes. They come in poker size, which is wider, and bridge size, which is narrow. See, there is a difference there. The bridge size is what I use to actually play Texas Hold'em in my garage. The poker size would be your seating cards. And how do you do that? Well, you pick out the cards by suit, like so. Table one, for example, would be the clubs. And if you have nine players at the table, you take ace through nine. And then diamonds would be table two, ace through nine. Say you had a third table, it could be hearts, ace through nine, right? So you've got three sets of seating cards right there. Just shuffle them up, boom, boom, boom. Put the other cards away, shuffle them up, boom, 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 shuffle, shuffle, shuffle. And you just spread it out, casino, dealer wash. And when people come in, you say, you take their money, you put it in a box, and you say, pick a seat, and they pick a card. This card's a different size than the cards they're gonna be playing with tonight, so they shouldn't get them confused. They got the four of clubs. You say, oh, clubs, that's table one, that's right here. Seat four is right over here, have a seat. Somebody else comes in and they pick, <laughs> and they pick, the five of hearts. You say, oh, five of hearts, that's table three. Head on over, the button is on the one. Your seat number five. Count from the button is one, two, three, four, five. Clockwise direction. That's how you do it for cheap. And that method works really well with one table. Works really well with two tables. Not so great with three tables because it's an extra suit to keep track of. But it's a way you can use my method and do it for no more than a couple bucks because that's what a cheap bicycle deck of playing cards costs. Again, the key for me is make sure they're a different size so you never ever ever get the seating cards mixed in with the playing cards. Super important. I'm going to do a whole video on cards. Alright, that's seating your players. How easy is that? Well that's only part of the equation if you have multiple tables. Now remember I said to you Use just one table, host a single table tournament, then you don't have to worry about any other seating issues. But if you've got multiple tables, if you've got two tables or three tables or more, now you've got some seating concerns as players bust out. It's very important as players bust out and you've got multiple tables 
to keep the tables balanced. That's part two of our video here. Part two, part two. First of all, what is keeping the tables balanced? What are you talking about? Well, let's look at this handy dandy graphic. This is my garage. I've got three tables, nine players each. Everybody's seated, everybody's on time. It's all good and we're underway. All of a sudden, we have a player bust out from table two. Oh no! Well, it happens. It's a poker tournament. Are these tables balanced? Yes, they are because each table is within one player of each other. In other words, there's no more than a one player difference between all three tables. If table two loses another player, then the tables are out of balance because you've got nine, nine, and seven. That's a two player difference. Tables are unbalanced. You can never have a difference of more than one player between tables, so they have to be balanced. That's what balanced means. If you're in a situation where you've got three tables and the red table and the blue table each lose a player, then you're still balanced. You've got nine, eight, and eight. That's balanced. But if you lose another player from the red table, boop, now you're nine, eight, and seven. Seven and nine is a two player difference. So one of the players from nine has to come to table seven. When I'm in my garage, I yell over to the green table. I say, hey, green table, send us to your next big blind. And that's how you choose who comes over. If they're in a hand, it's whoever's gonna be the next big blind. If they're about to start a hand, it's their big blind. Say, send us your next big blind, come on over. They have to bring their chips over and we sit them down here. Now, where do we sit them at this table? They get the worst seat. And the worst seat means the seat that is closest to the oncoming big blind. Sometimes they can sit right down and take their big blind immediately. Other times, they seat in the worst seat as the big blind is approaching. Make sure your players know and understand this. I'm very lucky. I've got a lot of experienced players here who play in card rooms and they understand the whole, bring us your next big blind. And they also understand where that player is supposed to sit. So they, players help me out. If you've got a bunch of inexperienced people and you're doing multiple tables, it can get a little dicey. Like I said, start off with a single table. If you find yourself in a situation where all of your tables are balanced and one of the tables loses two players, so in this example, we've got nine, nine, and seven. How do you decide which table to pull from? Well, in my garage, it's always clockwise. If two tables have nine and one table has seven, one of the nines has to come and it's gonna be the table that is closer in a clockwise direction. So in this example, the closer table is table three, the green table. So table number three, send us your next big line and make sure you get into the worst seat. Where is the worst seat here? Anybody know? That's right, the worst seat is seat number four. That's where the big blind is going to hit next. So that's where they sit. Makes sense? I hope so. If I haven't been clear enough, please let me know in the comments. You know, I can always try again. Now, if you've got four tables or more, that's gonna get a little tricky for you. I host a tournament once a year with five tables and I do manage to play and keep the tables balanced and I can only do that because I've been doing this for a long time. I would not recommend that. If you're hosting multiple tables, more than three tables, four or more, uh, you really need to dedicate yourself to being the TD because there's going to be a lot of stuff coming up in that tournament that you have to deal with, including balancing tables, including coloring up, including keeping the peace and all of that. So uh, start out slow, work your way up, do it for 10 years before you start hosting uh, five table tournaments. It is fun, but it is a challenge. So I hope I've explained balancing tables well enough. Uh, we're gonna move on to the third and final topic here, which is breaking tables. <laughs> yes, we're talking about breaking tables, and that doesn't mean throwing your drunken friend into a table. It means as soon as you have the right numbers to get rid of a table, you do so. For example, in my garage, I've got three tables. I start the tournament with 27, nine players each. And as we lose players, of course, I balance the tables. But when we get to 18 total, that means I can get rid of table three. I'm breaking table three. And that applies for bigger tournaments as well, four or five tables or beyond. For example, if you have 20 tables, as soon as you have enough players to fill 19 tables, you're gonna break table number 20. 
Now there still will be players at table 20. Why? Because you've been balancing the whole time. You've been moving players back and forth to make sure that there's no more than one player difference between every table. Right, so how do you know when it's time to break the table? Let's just stick to my garage, three tables. We start with 27, we're getting down to 18. As soon as we get to 18, we're gonna break table number three. How do we know when it's time to do that? Well, these seating plaques really come in handy for that. That's why I recommend seating plaques or seating cards. You could even do it with the playing cards. You just have to be mindful. When a player busts out, I say to them, gosh, thanks for playing. Better luck next time. Don't forget to join us in the cash game. And also, can I have your seating plaque, please? Can I have your seating card? And they hand me their seating card. I keep these set aside. And as soon as I start to approach nine, I get ready and I know I'm gonna to have to break a table. So when I get to eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight plaques in front of me, I know one more player, it's time to break table three. When I get to eight, the first thing I do is I set aside plaques that I've gotten from the table that's going to break. That's table three. I set these aside. I still keep track of the total number, but I set these aside. I won't be using these to actually break the table. And as soon as another player busts, they hand me their seating plaque, and now I've got nine total in front of me. I'm setting aside the ones from the table that's breaking. So what do I have here? I've got, looks like five plaques in front of me. Now, when it's time to break the table, I recommend highly to you that you pause the tournament clock, especially if you're just starting out as a TD. Myself, after doing it for over a decade, I have gotten to the point where I don't pause the clock. I just take these plaques over along with some empty racks and I break the table like that. I do it very fast. People don't have time to react. I say, finish the hand you're on. I shuffle these up. You should pause the clock to do this. Shuffle these up right in front of table three. So it's totally random and I'm not even looking. And I look and I say, where's the button? Oh, the button's right there. I start with a small blind and I deal these out face up. Two, three, four, five. And as I'm dealing, I'll point out where their seats are. I say, Oh, you got table one, seat three here. So that means you're over at my table, the red table, uh, right next, you know, just two seats to my left. Oh, you got table two, seat six. You're over at the blue table. Uh, Tina, hold up your hand. Yeah, you're sitting right next to Tina. I let them know where the seats are. These are players who have been playing in this garage for 10 years. They still, they don't pay attention half the time. So then the players are off with their chips to the new seats and remember, they come into the new seats. They can come in at any position, small blind, big blind, button. It doesn't matter. The only rule of thumb that you have to keep in mind is that the players at tables one and two, that is the tables that were not broken, they can't play the big blind twice. Now the players coming from the broken table, they potentially can play the big blind twice, which sucks for them. That's the way it goes. That's how you break a table. Now, if you're like me and you got three tables, you're only gonna have to really break one table and I'll explain, you got two tables left. Yes, eventually you're gonna have to break table two, but I don't really worry about the plaques after that, the seating plaques, because it doesn't matter because I redraw for the final table, all right? When you're down to two tables and you're gonna go to table one only, all you need to worry about is when are there nine players left playing poker, and as soon as there are, Pause the clock, I pause the clock, you should pause the clock because it's final table time. First thing everybody asks is, is this a break? Tell them right off the bat, I'm pausing the clock, we're gonna redraw for final table, this is not a break. That's all you have to say. This is not a break. Eventually you're gonna give them a little bit of a break, but just to quiet down the chatter, you should already have if you're like me and you're a smart host, you play at the final table. If you're still playing, you should have all the plaques in front of you. You can collect them at any time. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I collect them. As soon as there's two tables, I collect them. I have them in my drawer. First thing I do is I'm, if I'm still playing, I give myself table one, seat one that I'm already sitting in. I shuffle up the remaining eight and I look at the table that I'm at. Where's the button? I start with a small blind and I deal the plaques until I'm out of players at table one. So let's say in this example, there's four total, right? It means we have five over at table two. And I walk over to table two and I say, where's the button? Oh, it's right there. So I'm gonna start at the small blind and I deal out the rest. At that point, once everybody has their seat, don't let anybody leave until they have their seat, then I say, 
This is a very short pee break. If you have to pee, go pee and then come back. Wash your hands. Well, I don't say that because they should know that, but you get the idea. You do give them a little bit of a break for the final table, but not right away because you don't want people just taking off. You want them to stick around so they can get their seat. Sometimes you will have players that have to pee and they just go and they don't stick around. Well, you're still going to give them their seat wherever their chips are and if need be, move their chips over. I wait till people are back from the bathroom and then I start the tournament clock again. So that's breaking tables, that's balancing tables, that's seating players when they come in through the front door. And as you can see, it's rather involved. I try to make it as simple as I could. I hope it came across. If there's any questions, please put them in the comments. I've been hosting poker tournaments for over a decade, but I've been shooting YouTube videos on how to run poker tournaments, uh, I think two other times in my life. So I hope it was clear. Remember, seating has to be random in a poker tournament. When your players, when your friends and family come in to play poker, seating has to be random. It's a skill game and there is skill involved depending on who you're sitting next to. Two, tables have to be balanced. This means no more than a difference of one player between each table if you've got multiple tables. As an aside, just host a single table tournament when you're starting out. And three, you are going to have to break a table if you have three tables or more. And I've explained how to break tables. <laughs> ah, ah, that was it. That was a lot. It was a long ass video. So glad you joined me. Uh, remember in this crazy time to be safe, be healthy, be kind to one another. And thank you, like and subscribe if you like and you want to subscribe. You know what I'm saying? It was great having you. As always, I will see you next time. Peace. We out.